joining us today. Um, welcome to the Grant Tech webinar on designing apps to solve challenges for life sciences and food and beverage manufacturers. Uh, my name is Sam Russell. I'm going to be kind of guiding us through the session today, but definitely want to welcome the, the Tulip team. Really excited to have them joining us. Uh, so Grant Tech and Tulip um, is a, a newer partnership. We got kicked off uh, sometime last year. Grant Tech really saw a lot of real potential in Tulip for, for a lot of our customers, um, especially those that kind of needed some MES-like or level three-like kind of capabilities, but maybe not some full-blown MES or kind of couldn't really um, ex easily extend the MES they had to, to accommodate a lot of those. So when you're sitting there wondering, is this a, a customization? Is this a custom app I need to build? Do I do something in my SCADA? Do I extend my MES? Like, what do I do? Tulip, great option to create applications that solve specific challenges that, that do kind of meet that MES IoT space where you need to be able to connect to a lot of different types of devices, maybe level two, level three, four and above, um, and really kind of get something done in a, an easy to use and intuitive environment. So it really excited to have Tulip here. Thank you all for joining us and uh, I'll let you all introduce yourselves in just a little bit. But before we do that, uh, I like to give a little uh, bit of guidelines and tips just to make sure everyone's getting the most out of the webinar. Um, so, you know, don't get distracted as much as you can. Close those Teams messages and emails. This is your lunch break or whatever. You can just focus for a little bit. Uh, hopefully that'll help out. Feel free to use the chat over on the side of your window. Uh, we'll get all those in and we can answer any questions and things like that as they come in. I always recommend people take notes. We do post these webinars and a video copy of them on our YouTube page. So really focus on kind of what your takeaways are and then what you plan to bring back to your business. And then finally, we have, a, a, I think, one poll uh, inside of this presentation and uh, definitely encourage everybody to, to participate in that and give us a little bit of feedback. So today, what are we going to cover? So we're actually going to start with a little preamble for me around kind of the real value of data and why we are making these connected applications. And then we're really going to hand things over more to the Tulip team where we're going to talk about using apps to expand MES and SCADA. Then we get to the always eagerly anticipated yet slightly risky live demo uh, of the product that we're going to have on the Tulip side. Uh, we'll go over a couple of tips and tricks on how to get started and then open things up for a Q&A. So a couple of introductions. Who's who in the room? Um, so again, I'm Sam Russell. I'm the Senior Director of Smart Manufacturing Solutions over at Grant Tech, and I'm very happy to be joined by, by two colleagues over on the Tulip side today. If you guys would like to introduce, your, introduce yourselves. Yeah, so I can start here. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Gilad Langer. I'm the industry practice lead at Tulip. Uh, I help our customers better understand their technology and help you know both in uh, pre-sales and post-sales uh, to make sure that uh, you use your te our technology in the best possible way. Again, this is digital transformation, so it takes a bit more uh, of a different approach to how we do things. I am coming to you uh, from our, uh, uh, our experience center, our, what we call our Tulip Experience Center. Actually, Nanad is sitting uh, or standing right across for me in, in uh, another part of our room. Behind me is our, what we call our mission control. Uh, so again, very happy to be on this uh, on this webinar and uh, give it over to Nanad. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Nanad Dev. I'm a pre-sales engineer at Tulip. I've been working with Tulip since 2018. I'm mainly focused in life sciences spaces right now, but I have worked in other industries as well. So if you have any questions around the Tulip platform, I'll be your person. I'm in the Tulip Experience Center as well, uh, and I'm in front of our, one of our wing and dispensing setup uh, in the Tulip Experience Center. And I'll be walking you through how Tulip can guide the operator through step-by-step -step instructions and capture data from IoT devices as well. So looking forward to introducing you what the platform yeah, can do. Great. Thanks again, both of you, for joining us. Really excited. Uh, with that, actually, I'm going to throw up a poll question, and uh, Jeff, our, our man behind the curtain, is going to go and make that available to everybody. We're, again, this is a, a webinar around food and beverage and life sciences and maybe some others, too. We're curious around who's in the room. Maybe we get to tailor a little bit of our material, uh, kind of depending on where people are coming in from. Uh, as we're waiting to get a couple of answers in on that, um, I'll maybe throw out a, an advertisement for that Tulip Experience Center up in Boston. Uh, I got to go when you guys did that kickoff uh, an open, grand opening for that a few months ago. Uh, and it's a really, really cool experience to go and see uh, a lot of different machinery and kind of Tulip apps that are all embedded into it. I got to wear one of the cool AR glasses, headsets and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, really cool spot. 
Uh, as things are coming in, uh, looks like we are about two thirds life sciences, about one third food and beverage um, with somebody else kind of uh, sneaking in just to learn a little bit more about Tulip or just give us our love and support, either which of is uh, totally fine with me. So uh, thanks everybody for joining in and uh, great to hear it. And thanks for uh, spending your time with us today. So to kind of set the stage, let's talk a little bit about the real value of data and kind of how we're using that in manufacturing. Um, so you may have seen a graphic like this before. Uh, it's a popular way to kind of break down a company's maturity around the data they have and how they use it and how it forms their decision making. So if you've got any type of data that you can like display on a screen, you are doing that descriptive data, what is happening at the bottom level of this pyramid. Data, descriptive data is generally table stakes. A lot of us are gonna have that today. We need to know what's shipped. We need to know, uh, inform operators how their systems are running. We need to be able to show critical control points and keep them within acceptable bounds. It's not to say that everybody has all the descriptive data that they want or need. Uh, There's still islands of automation and all of these closed systems, but generally descriptive data is something that you're using in your everyday life. As we go up to higher levels of the pyramid, um, things really do start to vary more by maturity, industry to industry, company to company, even sometimes line to line within a plant. So diagnostic analytics is more telling you uh, why something happened, why that descriptive analytic happened. So OEE, I think of as actually a good description of a diagnostic metric, right? So it's not only just telling you how you are performing compared to your efficiency, but it is diving into your availability, your downtime, uptime, your throughput, so that you know where you need to focus. If you have a 50% OEE, diving in deeper and saying, well, 90% of that was due to quality issues can really help you define and, and kind of dive deeper into that high level metric. Predictive analytics is more uh, one of the most rapidly growing spaces in manufacturing. Um, so this is the idea of anticipating uh, something before it actually happens. Um, predictive analytics is particular, particularly matured in the spaces where it is industry agnostic. So think about, um, you can probably see a lot of things around predictive maintenance, especially around common pieces of equipment, like say a valve or a motor that's gonna be in just about every manufacturing system in the world, right? So uh, those are actually pretty mature at this point. And really the next evolution here is around making more process specific predictive analytics, right? Looking at your specific manufacturing process and trying to predict outcomes. And, and that gold star is at the top, that prescriptive top of the pyramid, right? So not only are we predicting the future, but our computer systems are running if then scenarios and also advising us on the best corrective action to take. So we wanted to start with this because we want people thinking about what, what data you have today and what you could be accessing that's gonna bring you more success and how you use it. So think about how like different parts of your organization might be at different levels of maturity on this curve. It's not uncommon to say, uh, see maybe your supply chain has AI and machine learning kind of built into it to start to predict down to the minute when certain orders are gonna hit certain customers but maybe that batch tank that's uh, out in the field only has a paper chart recorder onto it and you need to have somebody go out there and grab it to, to get your data every day, right? So again, same organization can have very different levels of, of data maturity uh, that you could be raising to, to be more efficient. Um, another thing that we wanted to talk about too um, is to make sure that we're trying to tie all of these challenges that we're solving to their tangible business value right. So as I was talking about those paper batch records, um, you know, uh, as an example, that can waste a lot of people's time and effort. It can increase the risk of mistakes. It could lead you to scrap product. Um, and just looking at descriptive analytics can really help you around that batching process just to understand where you're at. But if you're maybe struggling to hit production numbers overall, you might need a better system to do that real-time analysis and do more of the predictive side to figure out when that production shortfall may happen in the future and how much trouble you might be in. Um, and of course, all of these problems, um, it's always important to think that they are not just solved by some technology alone. Us installing a Tulip app usually is not going to fix the problems. It is also making sure that you are coaching the right people to use that app and giving them the right processes along with that technology to solve real problems, right? Um, and that's definitely one of those things that comes up a lot as we're talking about the big monolithic MES applications. If you're talking about an MES, that's gonna do 20 different things. 
some of the details around the people, process, and technology can kind of get lost in the sauce. Um, but really, when we're talking about more of a single application and building from there, it does really give you that intentional change around making sure those people really understand, making sure that you're having the processes in place without really kind of reformatting how your entire plant works together. So a uh, great way to kind of solve a specific problem and make sure that you're considering all of these, these workflows together. Um, also, of course, that really encourages the, the agile MES and IoT design that Grantech has really embraced recently and seen a lot of success in, right? So again, that kind of big monolithic waterfall approach of trying to buy a whole system and not really getting any value until the entire thing is commissioned. Thing of the past, we're more focused on find an individual problem, solve it, be iterating on this over time so that you're constantly adding value back into the organization and essentially self-funding your digital transformation. So all that being said, right, they have the big takeaways here. This data is important. The way that we can kind of use it to solve problems and iterate on that over time is really a great way to show good incremental value. Now let's kind of bring it over to the Tulip team and talk about how we can be using applications like this to expand our MES and SCADA platform. So uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Sam. Yeah. So in order that, you know, before we start, I think we need to take a bit of a step back to see kind of where we are and, and why are we even doing this? So uh, please, next slide. Uh, you know, what we hear about digital transformation, I'm sure everybody has heard about it, Industry 4.0, Pharma 4.0, uh, a number of different concepts come up, come around. You know, uh, if you're familiar with the Pharma 4.0 initiative, we talk a lot about uh, digital maturity. If you've seen some of the uh, information coming out of Tulip, we talk about connected workers, frontline operations platform. Um, and then of course, we are in GXP land. And so uh, a lot of the Pharma 4.0 uh, has to do with how we look at uh, validating these systems, et cetera. So basically all in all, I think, you know, there, there's, there's kind of, there's a lot of confusion around what is and what isn't digital transformation. I think uh, the easy way to look at it is first of all, uh, it's about the operator. Productivity comes from the operator. Uh, focusing on the operator versus the process is what we are doing all the time. Uh, and and I'll get to it at the end, but this digital maturity actually is the easiest of the of, of, of them all uh, to achieve. Uh, and I'll explain that a bit a, a bit about or a bit about it more. But if we think next slide, please. Um, if you hear what's going on in the industry, right? Um, it, it's and Sam mentioned some of that. Uh, you know, it, it's it's this pain of trying to get what we know as digital systems to work. Uh, with everything that we put in the system, into, into the uh, production floor, we still have limited visibility. We are still paper, there's still paper everywhere. If, you've, if you're from life sciences, 80% uh, of life sciences still operates on paper. And the, if you take a look at some of the studies that are going on uh, at a global level, uh, you know, the, the major or the, the, the most common uh, source of error is humans, humans uh, making errors it's still one of the biggest problems that, that we're having. So putting all of this together, we have this new technology coming at us yet, you know, uh, and we've had to we've used technology for the last uh, at least three decades, but still we haven't solved the problem. So, you know, the, the question is, is this going to solve it for us? And the answer is yes, but you have to be clear that it's going to be done in a very, very different way that you've done it before. So next slide, please. Because the systems that we use today are monolithic because they're focused on process. What they do is they, they take the human aside and try to model what you do in the process. And, and you know, with that, we end up with very complex deployments. The operators are second thought that, you know, they, they have to use what's there. And then this, uh, you know, locked in and all in nothing. You have, you buy these systems for one vendor and they want you, they lock you into supply. That's, you know, very different in the, in the new world. Uh, and then the uh, ITOT Rift uh, is going on, and this general reliance on a third party uh, because of the complexity. So next slide, please. So what the you know the answer of course is 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 this modern SaaS based cloud based technology that is human centric, and that essentially was what Tulip offered. So you have to look at Tulip at you know, not only a new beta system, it is a complete paradigm shift. 
we're going from thinking about how to model processes to how to augment operators. And I'll explain how all that factors into a life science environment where you're trying to capture things like EBR and EDHR. But in essence, you know, it's cloud-based, off-the-shelf, democratized, meaning it's self-serve. You don't need expert help. You should be able to use it yourself. Easy to validate. Validation is seamless. GMP compliance is just inherently part of the platform, adhering to the new guidances like CSA. And all, of, all in all, and I think if, you know, if the easiest way to judge whether technology is industry 4.0 or digital or it's going to help us is how fast you get value out of the system. That is, you know, there's many things that you can ask. Does it do this? Does it have IoT, etc. How fast can you get value? And if the value needs to come order of magnitude faster, meaning that if it takes you a year to put in MES, it should take you weeks to put in to, to solve the same problem with tool. Uh, and that is that's can that's proven. So that, that's a simple way to ask any kind of supplier in the industry right now, how fast can you provide value? If the answer is months and years, you can disqualify immediately. That's at least our perspective. So next slide please. Um, and you know and that's actually you know uh, one of the things that uh, uh, you know this slide like tries to portray. You know the 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 traditional the traditional systems that you put in are really on high risk. You have to put all the up investment up front, spend a lot of time before you get value. With modern systems like Tulip, you're iterating from the bottoms up. So you're building value as you go. That's essentially you start with one or two apps, you iterate through them, add another one, add another one. And every time you do that, you're basically providing value. And it can be by instrumenting your process to provide a digital record. Uh, or it could be by actually improving your manufacturing. And uh, the beauty of it all is if you do it correctly, you actually get both. You get your compliance in check and you can get you know, uh, uh, operational improvements. Now, and again, if you look at the bottom there, that's what I'm trying to emphasize, the order of magnitude difference in time to value. It, it's, you know, it's month on the top and weeks uh, at the bottom. And this is, this is not a, this is this is proven. It's not just something that you know we're saying here. We have plenty of examples of how it's done. And again, uh, we of course uh, would like to encourage you to try it yourself. It's low. It's a, it's a low risk start, and you could show value very quick. So with that, I think I have one more slide before uh, we go over to demo. Uh, and this one is uh, trying to. And I think you know it's, it's a preamble kind of a, a, a setting the stage for the demo. Let's you know the top half. The gray part is how you traditionally take a look, uh, in, implement, let's say, EBR, EDHR, or any kind of MES system. Typically, we start with paper. You have to translate your pa paper, which is basically the definition of the process, into a structure, typically an IS88 type recipe model, or some level of master data in your MES that is pretty complicated and requires a very unique skill set. At a minimum, you need to know how to use the software. Uh, typically, you also have to know and be very well versed in something called IS88 recipe models to just understand how to translate it from paper. That takes a lot of time. It has a regulatory implications because, hey, you told regulators, here's my piece of paper, how I make stuff. Now it's in a very complicated structure that is very hard to, to explain to an auditor. And then you go to the, you know, and that obviously takes the three to six months, really, if you're really good at it. Uh, and then you have to take this uh, monolithic system down to your operator and explain to them how to, you know, how to, how to use it because it's not designed for the operator. It's designed to execute a ISA 88 style recipe structure. So the operator needs to adapt to it, right? And then on top of that, you have all the validation. So, you know, six to 12 months, uh, an effort and, you know, it, it's working. Yeah, there's plenty of example of this working. It's not, that's not the problem. Uh, it just takes time. And then all the data goes into this very complicated proprietary database. And now we have to look at our batch record. So what do we do? We get people who understand the database. We're not in SQL, writing reports, extracting the data, and then uh, you're creating a PDF out of it. And the absurdity of all this is that basically you started with paper and end with paper. Uh, you spend a lot of money and, and a lot of risk, but you're getting, you know, you're going from one end to, as I call it, electronic paper in, in a way. So in the new world with Tulip, very different. Well, we start in the same spot. We start with paper, but you translate your process from paper to what we call apps. And apps are, think about apps as a, uh, a discrete 
little software application that uh, is built with uh, uh, with something that looks like PowerPoint that caters to an operator doing something in a physical location with some equipment. And the way you build it, uh, the people who build it can be the same people that created the paper. And so they're translating it into basically it's taking it's essentially the same going from Word to uh, PowerPoint and Excel. And they're building it hand in hand with the operator. So once the operator gets to it, he actually knows how to use it. It's very intuitive and it's also caters to him. All this happens within three to six weeks. Validation, I'll touch on that at the end of the presentation. Uh, you know, getting the operator to use it uh, is, is basically zero training or very little training. And all the data gets captured in the cloud in a manner that is completely transparent, essentially looks like a spreadsheet that you can report on or extract data on in the same way that you do in a spreadsheet, which means charts, graphs, pivot tables, et cetera. So that's what makes all of this so fast. And you can see again, the order of magnitude difference. Uh, you know, the, the next, uh, we'll give it over to demo, but again, uh, I, er, you know, I usually say after this slide, I can talk about this all day long. <laughs> you really have to try to, to, you have to try to believe it. Uh, again, so that's, uh, that's a real call to action here. But uh, uh, with that, I think it's time to see uh, how it really works. So over to you, uh, Nina. Awesome, okay. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Just give me a second. Please let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, I think we got it. Perfect, okay. Uh, I also want you to keep an uh, eye on the video side as well, cause uh, it's a cyber physical platform, right? Like we have edge devices uh, that can be used to integrate with uh, different IoT uh, devices that you might have on the shop floor, uh, like digital scales, uh, label printers, calipers, uh, any kind of measurements that you might want to capture from the process itself. We have these two edge devices that can be used to uh, integrate with those equipments and pull in data from those equipments. So on this video side, if you are able to focus, uh, I have this uh, flow hood out over here. Uh, this flow hood is also integrated with Tulip platform. It has a, a API endpoint that it exposes and we can capture the fan speed and so on from this flow hood as well. I have a O house uh, scale that can be used to capture data uh, for my weighing and dispensing process. I have a label printer as well that can be used to print out labels. I have a foot paddle uh, at the bottom of the station that I can use to progress through the applications. If my hands are busy, for example, in this box, I cannot touch the touch screen every single time. So uh, the screen share that you're looking at is the Tulip player. That's the end user interface. That's where the operators would, would be interacting with the application itself. Um, so this is completely device agnostic piece of software. You can execute this on PCs, on mobile phones, on tablets, on iOS, Android devices, on wearable devices as well. So I'm getting a list of uh, work orders from my ERP system. So we are an open platform. We can be integrated with any kind of solutions that you might have, learning management solutions, CMMS solutions for equipment data, ERP systems. So by using one of those systems, I can quickly identify if the logged in user is trained on this specific process to execute or not. Right? Like, so I can quickly identify that I'm not uh, authorized to execute this process. The flow hood, there's a light kit on top of this, a light strip that has gone red as well. So everyone on the shop floor knows something is happening on the station. So I'm gonna change a user. I'm gonna log in as an experienced user. We can integrate with your uh, single sign-on solution and you can have username and password as uh, as uh, logins. Uh, so once I'm logged in again, I can see a list of work orders. I can pick that up. Uh, as Gilad mentioned, right? Like we are approaching uh, the digitization process in a completely different way. So on Tulip platform, you're creating common data models that can be used to share data between uh, different applications. So for example, at the bottom right, I can see the status of this equipment is dirty. This can come from my equipment logbook application, and I can use those data points to drive the workflow for my weighing and dispensing process. So for example, I cannot execute this. The equipment is not clean. Maybe I was using it for a different batch for different material. So now I can guide the operator through a logbook application. Uh, they can uh, scan QR codes on these uh, equipment to quickly filter through all of this information, or they can even select one. 
depending on the data points that were captured on the logbook application i can identify whether do i need to do a main, uh, minor clean or do i need to provide a major clean so it looks like i need to do a major clean process so again using those data points between different applications to drive the workflow for a weighing and dispensing process for example so here i'm guiding the operator through a checklist i can quickly go and complete this if i need to capture some temperature i can go in and capture that temperature uh, information as well um, uh, i can also use device cameras to capture images of evidences of these actions being performed right like yes i am capturing all of this data uh, through check boxes and through temperature and so on but i also want the evidence that this action was being performed and the equipment was clean so i can quickly go and capture an image i can complete this my supervisor can verify all of this information and provide the e signature at the time of the uh, uh, at the required time so when i'm providing my e signatures on tulip platform i'm also reviewing the data that i'm going to be providing the e signature on and just like logins uh, uh we'll have username and password once we have integrated with your active directory but for this demo i'm just providing my badge number and we are capturing timestamps around that as well and at this point if i go back to my weighing and dispensing application the equipment is clean the uh, light strip has gone green so at this point i can execute a specific work order so moving on to the next step your tulip platform can also provide uh, ability to work with javascript so you can actually go in and create your own widgets like this one if i want to go in and create that on the next step the application is actually going to generate a batch number and create a label for us so the label printed uh, label printer printed out all the information i can have all kinds of information on these labels as well um so first thing that i need to do is the prep instructions go through checklist if i have my hands busy i cannot touch the touch screen so i'm going to use the foot pedal so without me interacting with the touch screen i'm able to complete the checklist and move on to the next step right like so you're keeping the ui ux and the uh, the usability of the application super simple so that the operators uh, have all the information first of all have all the information in front of them and it's super easy for them to quickly go and capture information uh, around whatever they are doing so here i have bombs uh, for my weighing and dispensing process based on the work order that i selected so i'm going to go in and start weighing out material so first things first i need to acknowledge that i'm using an active ingredient and on this step the the uh, the foot pedal does not work because i need to acknowledge that i understand uh, the classification of the material and move on to the next step on the next step i need to first of all capture the tar weight uh, all of the information that's been captured from equipment is in uh, real time so when i place the tray on the scale the tar weight is updated you are poking working the process with tulu platform so if i go in scan wrong lot numbers the application will tell me that okay you're scanning wrong, wrong lot numbers please stop doing that maybe you want to capture this information as well so that you can train your operators better but when i do scan the right lot number the application will let me move on to the next step and here i can start capturing data from my scale so uh, as i said earlier it's all real time you can uh, define thresholds behind these uh, equipments as well so if i am outside of the threshold the application will show that to me uh, through color coding but when i am within the threshold the application will let me uh, visualize that of course first of all it's all green and at this point using the foot pedal i can move on to the next step and print out maybe a material uh, label as well so with that uh, i can go and uh, make sure that all my labels are printed out and provide my e signature as well at this point so rather than going through every single step which i'm going to be repeating myself uh, i'd like to take a quick pause and and see if this is making sense and if it is uh, or if you have any questions if not i'd like to pass the presentation back to sam yeah i'm not getting any questions in the chat just yet so uh i am going to assume that you just uh nailed it 100 percent. no no further questions um oh sorry now they're popping in um i do see one um just kind of around uh, audit trail capabilities or inside of the platform yeah so chula platform has multiple different audit trails we have audit trails when the application builder is actually building out the applications uh there's there's of course uh, enterprise roles and permissions 
We also have audit trails in terms of changes that are being made to the application. So there's approval process, there's version control on the platform. On, and on the application execution side, all the actions that the operators are taking are recorded with timestamps. Uh, everything is uh, uh, recorded in real time. All the data points that are being uh, recorded are immutable as well. So no one can go in and mess around with those data points too. So there are multiple audits. Great, and then uh, one other to... question um, around NIMI authentication. Have you all done a, a NIMI integration with Tulip yet? Uh, yes, we have done NIMI integration for a few Excellent. of our customers. Great. All right, so uh, if there's any other questions on that, please feel free to continue dropping them in the chat. And when we get to the end for the, the Q&A to wrap up, we'll, we'll make sure that we bring any of that back. Uh, for now, I'm going to bring everyone's favorite thing back up, PowerPoint. Just a minute. There we go. All right. So... After that, clearly, everyone's question is going to be, well, how would I get started? And how would I start to build an app like that and start to, to get this into my plan? So again, actually, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Gilad, who's going to go and talk about some next steps uh, before we wrap things up. Yeah, so that's actually a very easy answer to, uh, a very uh, easy question to answer. Uh, because it's all bottoms up, and you, know, it's, it, you don't have to do much more than just walk out to your floor and figure out where your biggest pain is or where you want to start. And that's where we start. And you can see, since applications are really are uh, helping somebody do a job in a specific area, you know, you can start in multiple locations. We do see, you know, a lot of customers doing different things. For example, logbooks are very popular because a lot of the logbooks that we see out there are paper. Um, but then you can also start, uh, you know, capturing uh, information that you consider EBR. Again, you don't have to digitize everything on your floor. You can actually start somewhere, like the way in the Spence, which is, which is pretty common uh, place to start, but doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, formulation or in your bioreactor suite, it doesn't really matter. Uh, even partial, uh, you know, maybe just digitize the setup of a bioreactor before you even start recording the batch record. Again, it builds on each other. It's you, just because you're starting doesn't mean you have to, don't have to, Think about the complete solution uh, in from day one. You start small and build on uh, app on app on app, and that's how it works. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, the answer is like get started right there. So, we do have uh, something called the Tulip Library. Um, when in there, there is a, a number of starting points. So, again, the, the typical question we get is cool, uh, we can start, but why do we have to build everything ourselves or from scratch? Well, the answer is you don't. Uh, and I usually you know, ask people, when's the last time that you created a PowerPoint from a completely blank file where there was just nothing? You always take your last PowerPoint and change a few things and move on. So for that, we, divide, we have a Tulip app library. Uh, in the library, you can get a, a many different places, starting points, uh, example like logbooks and uh, even even ways to define to, uh, to do your batch review. Um, uh, and with that, you can get some, you know, some very quick uh, uh, apps built and, and again, rapid time to value. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the, the next big question, and I think we already had uh, a, a kind of an initial nibble at that is with audit trails. So uh, Tulip is, uh, is what we call GMP ready. Uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, uh, to, first of all, we're ISO certified. Uh, and uh, our platform, uh, uh, you know, the e-signatures, it's e-signature compliant or ERES compliant and, and uh, Alcoa compliant. Uh, on top of that, uh, we've been audited by now, uh, I think eight of the major pharmaceutical companies that have used Tulip or deemed Tulip as a qualified platform, meaning that it's uh, available for use for them in their GMP operations. Um, and another kind of a, um, interesting fact or interesting initiative is that uh, myself and uh, our uh, quality practice lead, Michelle, very active in uh, the Pharma 4.0 group, specifically the Validation 4.0 group. Uh, and Tulip is in a way an example of what we consider Validation 4.0. Uh, Tulip is a 100% uh, fully digital uh, QMS. We actually do not have documents. All our software, uh, uh, development and develop, software development lifecycle, again, which is 100% uh, part of our QMS and auditable, uh, generates everything digitally. 
Every, all the signatures, all the cap, everything is digital. And we provide to you as a customer kind of a, a fully digital uh, set of uh, uh, set of digital content or information that actually is structured that looks like documents because that's what the industry wants to see um, uh, that you can use as kind of the basis after your audit. Next slide, please. Um, the, 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 and we're kind of, the next question we get is that that's cool, but how would you validate a system like Tulip? Well, first, you, you know, I just talked the fact that the platform is qualified. So if you consider it qualified, really at the, what you have to do is then uh, qualify and validate the content that you build, the apps that you build on top of Tulip. And we subscribe, of course, to uh, the new guidance, the new CSA guidance, which is, you know, validate, uh, validate for intended use and, 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 and risk-based. And that actually simplifies the validation process a lot, which is an important part of how you use Tula because it's about using, you know, building apps very quickly and iterating through changes. Consider, you know, consider Tula app in a way as digital content, like you would content in your uh, QMS or PLM. Every app has a life cycle. And when you execute an app, it has, not only does it have an audit trail, but it actually captures everything that it does in a digital audit log. Uh, so you can, in fact, you know, just as simplistically put, you can create a version of the app, run it through a test protocol. It actually captures data automatically about everything that it did. And you can use that data as your evidence of the fact that you've uh, uh, done your protocol. You go through a new number of approval processes that you define in a bit, and then the app is ready for use. Uh, we have customers that, you know, can push an app to the floor within uh, within hours, basically run through the whole their whole process uh, and get an app out in a validated state within a few hours. Next, please. Oh, sorry. Over to you, Sam. Yeah, actually, back to me to wrap things up. Thank you both so much for kind of giving us that that deeper dive into Tulip. Uh, I really thought it was great. I think it's a really cool application. Just kind of love to see it in practice. Uh, I'm going to be quick on this because we got some good questions coming up in the chat. But, you know, we, we did want to kind of talk about just a couple of things you can be asking yourself to make sure that you're ready for something like Tulip. I'm definitely not going to walk through every one of these, but let's at least focus on those bold ones, right, around starting with with purpose. Uh, it was said, well, like, you know, it's, it's not that hard. You, you walk through your floor and you can pick just some of the most obvious problems that you've been trying to fix for, for a long time right now. And there's a lot of applications for uh, a lot of opportunities for applications like Tulip to go through and maybe help you out with that. So, you know, I don't recommend just downloading it and playing around like with, with the fun new toy, though it is a lot of fun. Uh, but really, when you want to start to see those returns, you, you pick the problem, you start building your use cases. Um, definitely recommend scaling in size and sophistication over time, right? Again, another recurring theme that we've brought up a couple of times here. The nice thing about Tulip is that we can start with a, a single thing that we're building in a couple of weeks and solving a direct problem. And the idea is that we can expand that app or use that mentality to make entirely new apps over time. So really start with that thing that it's not going to take 12 months. It's going to take 12 weeks for you to get to from start to end on it. And then finally, just addressing change management, right? Both from the validation perspective that we were just talking about, but also just kind of making sure that we're thinking about that that uh, how people are going to use these apps every day. And then it is probably going to change the way that you deal with change management. There is a, a highly likelihood that, you know, these aren't going to, these applications aren't going to update as frequently as the, the ones on your phone, but they're probably going to update a lot faster than your, your MES or your SCADA system, right? So, uh, so really making sure that you have the systems in place to, to accommodate and embrace that change to deliver more value uh, is going to be really important. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's jump over and we are going to answer a couple of questions. I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, I will pick the ones that Jeff is sending over to me. Give me just a minute. Uh, one of the questions here is around how about login credentials? Can it be by fingerprint or face recognition? Also, is the system validated to be regulatorily compliant and pass GFSI audits? GSFI, sorry, GFSI. <laughs> so, so I can talk about the login credentials and Gillard can take over the audit. Um, so yeah, definitely you can use fingerprint. Uh, facial recognition is something that we have not tried with our customers. That, that has not come up. But we are more than happy to try out any new technologies that can integrate with our platform. So yeah, we can definitely do that. And and as I answered earlier, right, like we have integrated with Navy Band uh, uh, in the past. So yeah, we can definitely have biometric uh, logins on on the platform. Um, 
So regarding uh, audio tech compliance, so um, in, in terms of, uh, I'm not familiar with GFSI. That's the question that we probably need to give to Michelle, which our, which our quality practice lead. Um, in general, you know, so we are compliant with uh, uh, Annex 11 and Part 11 uh, and uh, Alcoa, meaning that the data, you know, there's data integrity as per Alcoa. I'm assuming uh, I'm assuming the GFSI is a food and beverage. Uh, mm -hmm. It is. This, and it has to do with, with certificates, etc. Uh, my take is it it's just a matter of extracting the data in a way that's required. The data is, from that perspective, compliant. Yeah. Typically, if it can do life sciences, it can do the food and beverage side too. Which is it, yeah. Um, so that should be fine. Uh, next question: Have regular have regulatory authorities seen and approved of this modality? Twenty one CFR Part Eleven, uh, all compliant, correct? And then there's also a question around how you deal with storage space. Right. Uh, there's two different things. <laughs> so the, yeah, so the platform the, the platform is uh, Part Eleven Annex Eleven compliant yes. and co on. So that is, uh, you know, you you can actually whoever is asking, we can we have a public shareable uh, link that you can actually see through how we comply with those requirements. Again, that typically needs to be uh, supported with, a, with an audit by uh, the customer. To check that, we have, as I said, we have uh, live sense customers running Tulip in uh, full, in, in basically drug product, drug substance, and medical device, class two and class three. Uh, so I think that is proof that is it is compliant in, in a way. Um, in, in, in terms of storage, the question comes up uh, uh, quite often. It's uh, it's one of, it's it's the one I actually enjoy to answer the most because you know we are in the cloud. Uh, it's, it's you know in the cloud there's something called elastic storage, but uh, the point is that you know in a way the cloud has uh, infinite storage capacity. Uh, I usually answer. I usually then say that in probably my daughter, my 15 year old daughter, has more data in her TikTok account than any <laughs> client that I know of will have data in two. So I think there's plenty of room, and I don't think it's an issue. <laughs> Uh, that could be a very impressive TikTok, though. Who knows? Uh, next one. Uh, are there any? And this is a good question. Um, have you all run into any equipment vendors that uh, you've really struggled to integrate with, and you found that the platform hasn't been compatible with? So, so yeah, that's a great question. And our edge devices provide something called Node Red. Node Red is a, a, a GUI interface a way of creating drivers. So you can go in and create your own proprietary drivers for your own proprietary equipment if you have any, and uh, we'll be able to integrate with them. So like, for example, one of our biggest customers out there has 150 of these, and they were able to integrate with their own proprietary equipment that no other vendor was able to uh, uh, by using Node-RED on yeah, our so, so maybe not always out of the box, but you got an answer to help you solve the problem if, it's, uh, if you're running into an issue, right? Perfect. That is correct. Yep. Um, next one are also kind of related. I'll break them up though. So the first is just kind of around the, the pricing model in general. Like what do you buy and how does the software scale over time? You want to take that in now or should I? Um, yeah, I, I, I can. Uh, so uh, the pricing model is based on station based. Uh, so whatever consumption of uh, uh, applications are happening, wherever they are happening, that's what is a license. So uh, on the wing and dispensing station, uh, this would be one license to run this application itself. Uh, but there's no limitations on number of users that you can have on the platform, number of applications that you can build, number of data points you can capture. Uh, it's all unlimited. All we care about is the interaction with the platform on mm -hmm. the shop floor. And by the way, if you have multiple shifts, you can share licenses between multiple shifts as well. So for example, let's say you have 100 employees, 50 work the first shift, 50 work the second shift, you just have to buy 50 licenses. Cool. Just want to add, uh, is this, it's a SaaS, SaaS subscription model. So it's a subscription license. So you buy licenses, a station, uh, paid annual, and it's a, you, you, you pay for what you use. And uh, it's it's SaaS only, right? There's not an on-premise option. It is a SaaS piece of software. That is how how it is works, right? It is if that is correct. It is SaaS. Uh, this we do have two options in how we we run. Uh, so it's what we call Tool of Cloud and Tool of Customer Cloud. So you can actually run it in your virtual private cloud if you have one and know what that is. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Um, so it looks like there could be a number of apps that you would build up to, to create a, a complete solution. So how do you manage change in multiple apps and maintain compliance across them? 
It's the same way that you manage compliance through with multiple documents. Each document has a life cycle and you go through a change management process to approve the document. The same thing, an app is like it's content, like a document. Okay. Right. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, right, like we have approval processes and version control. So no, and of course permissions. So no one can just blindly make changes to the application and publish those out. You need to go through right. that approval Perfect. process. Okay. And you know what? I'll take this last one. Um, so uh, we have mentioned a couple of times that, that this is really great for, for agile development and kind of how does that compare to waterfall project management? Can we be doing waterfall inside of this, right? So really waterfall and agile, right? Just are more product project management methodologies and kind of the way that we, we get to our solution where waterfall is more of a, you know, rigid kind of step usually where you have your scope, you kind of write out all your requirements, you do design documentation, you build, and then at the end you, you get your application, right? Um, whereas Agile is usually more you have a controlled sprint with certain user stories that you build and you're collaborating with your customer more frequently uh, and building that app iteratively over time. Of course, either style can work for a Tulip application, though I definitely think that that more Agile approach suits the application itself and kind of just the mentality that we're going into of making something that is more operator focused and can adjust to the work of the people that need to do the work instead of being really locked into a, a rigid process and that really being the thing that defines the app. So um, yeah, of course, uh, either can work, but I think this is a really great and unique opportunity to use Agile. Um, okay, you know, and I did get one more audience question up, uh, which is if the system goes down, what is the backup solution? Um, so, you know, that's like asking what happens when the internet goes down. Yeah. Uh, again, SaaS, uh, SaaS solutions and cloud-based solutions, uh, you know, are, are meant to, are driven to be what it calls high availability. Uh, we have SLAs and these SLAs, you know, we typically, uh, commit to, uh, what we call three nines, uh, availability and, and, and uh, 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 sort of performance. Um, so the likelihood of, of that going down is very, very low. Uh, and then you typically cover that with your disaster recovery and business continu continuity plan. Again, disaster recovery is from our perspective, you know, we do have those uh, in place. Uh, remember this is a cloud-based, you know, multi-tenant cloud-based solutions just to, you know, if, if you don't understand the infrastructure and I'm not an expert in any given, in any way, you know, but just to understand that, you know, they're, they're highly resilient um, you know, every piece, for example, every piece of data is typically stored in nine different places. It's nearly impossible to lose data in a, in a cloud system, et cetera. So I think, you know, there's, pl there's plenty of documentation and, and, uh, and uh, information about this on both uh, AWS and Azure, which is the two uh, cloud providers that we use. And, and recently, Tulip also announced uh, uh, zero RPO time uh, for a multi-tenant customer. So if you are going to be using our cloud you also get the zero rpo along with the uh, with the platform itself. maybe explain what, explain is, what rpo is, is and i don't think everybody understands knows what that is yeah uh, so rpo would be a recovery point uh, object allowing customers to store operations data with minimal data loss risk in the event of disaster right like so if something goes wrong we can quickly pull up uh, uh, the backup from other instance with with zero downtime okay great um, actually, we do have two more that came in and then we'll wrap up. Uh, one uh, I can quickly take, which is who builds the apps and integrates the solution? Grant Tech, next question. No, um, more seriously, uh, Grant Tech is a, a integrator for Tulip. We do have a number of people that can train up. We, uh, we usually will try to find one of those applications, just like they were mentioned, out of the library and start to build from there, you know, stand on the shoulders of what's already been built before. Grant Tech is one integrator. There are others out there. Um, it is also a, a platform that in my experience, a lot of the training is available. It's very accessible. Um, and if you were have the interest of training up your own team to do something like that, you could probably get a couple of uh, sub, uh, system experts on your team as well. Um, Tulip, anything that you would want to add to that? Uh, again, you know, uh, in, in the true fashion, you know, digital, the new digital technology fashion, there's this notion of democratization of technology meaning that technology nowadays is much more uh, available for everybody and usable for everybody. Uh, and that's another one way to measure uh, if it's truly digital technology, how fast you can learn it. Uh, you know, think about, uh, think about setting up a printer in your home or your 
Google, your Google Assistant or whatever, and just plug it in a few steps and you're up and running. That is, that's the beauty of this new democratized world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. Yeah. And, and the reason why we have the no code platform and why it looks like a PowerPoint presentation is because we want to give the power to the people who are closest to the process to digitize their processes, right? Like, so keeping it simple so that you don't need any kind of programming background to start going in and creating these applications. Sam, I think we lost you. Oh, nope, I didn't hit the mute button hard enough. Um, it's a really great example of one of those times where, you know, you can teach yourself to do a lot of the basics on your own and then come to an integrator like Grantech when you come into something more complex, right? Like like we uh, the machine example earlier, if you had a machine maybe that didn't have plug and play compatibility with Tulip and you needed to write some node red drivers, maybe that's not the thing that you train up your team for, right? Maybe that is something we were calling an integrator or same with like ERP integration or something like that. But if you're talking about workflows and screens and the buttons that people click to do certain things um that it is a very accessible platform um definitely recommend you go and explore tulips website check out some of that training uh, i think you'll be very impressed okay and then one last just just tiny small scope question maybe to, to wrap us up uh, so Gilad, um what do you recommend is the best way to start with tulip and digital transformation in general Nice, easy question. As I said, so and that's so, and the answer is it, go walk your go walk your floor, find the form that's paper, and see how fast you can digitize it. <laughs> uh, and if you you know if you ask us to visit or grant it to visit, we'll do the same thing. Yeah, we're not going to sit in the room and try to understand all your problems. You just let's go find something to do right now, and we can you know we can discuss whether or not I would I would recommend you something that's impactful and not the uh, the the uh, toilet cleaning log. <laughs> for sure uh okay everybody well hey thank you all um great questions that came in on this round i really appreciate the participation from the audience today we are going to wrap it up there um remember everybody's going to get sent a recording to this webinar and we'll put it up on youtube and things like that if you have any questions you can always email info at grantech.com and we're happy to get back to you on it but again thank you everybody for spending the time today uh to listen to us thank you for the tulip team for for jumping in and giving us that great demo and background information. Um, hope everybody enjoyed and learned a lot today and we'll look forward to you on the next, uh, seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you so much Bye. guys.